Uh, yes, Mr. or Mrs. Degenerates, uh, we're calling about your chat's extended warranty. Hello, everybody. Welcome in. Welcome to the stream. Hopefully, you're doing well on this, uh, this lovely, lovely Tuesday. And, uh, glad you've decided to join me. Today, we're... Firing up a little bit of astronaut. So, uh, I know typically I try to introduce new games when we're bringing them up. And, uh, in this case, we're talking about astronauts, which, if you're not familiar, is an indie sort of space survival, crafting, salvaging. It's weird. It's a little bit of everything. Um, it's actually made by a company called Blue Bottle Games, and if that sounds familiar, then you've probably also played Neo Scavenger, which is the previous game that this developer slash team worked on uh, before they started on Astronauts. Um, and so Astronauts is their next game, and just like Neo Scavenger, it's it's been in early access for a while, and yes, the version that we're playing today is also... Uh, in an early access version, but it's in constant development. They're releasing updates and hot fixes and new features and all kinds of other fun stuff all the time, really. I, I feel like I see this game get updated at least once a week, sometimes more. Um, and it's really improved, especially over the last year or year and a half. There's been a lot of new features added. And so I figured we'd give it a whirl. I don't know why. I've just I've been in the mood for some astronauts, and uh, it's been um, probably, I don't I want to say, six months or so since the last time I played it, and there's been a lot of updates, a lot of additions, a lot of new features. Uh, so yeah, we're going to give it a shot and uh, see what's good. I will mention, though, because it is an early access uh, title, sometimes there are bugs, sometimes there are crashes. And sometimes I may have to open the console in order to fix little things like that. I mean, again, it is early access, but uh, the stability is much improved. So hopefully that'll be down to a minimum. Um, as always, feel free to chime in. Uh, some of you may be more familiar with the new changes than I am. I am, after all, working on some relatively outdated information, but we're going to give it a whirl. So let's get into it. And I have been having some issues with actually getting the astronauts audio to work. So uh, uh, let me know if you guys are experiencing any audio issues. Uh, yeah, Bamboozle, it is, it is actively being worked on. Like I said, I, I see very, very frequent updates on this game. So if you're curious, Feel free to give it a whirl. I think uh, the last time I looked, it was only 15 or $20 or something like that. So it's definitely not an expensive buy, and I've gotten many, many, many hours out of it. So this is it. Uh, again, this is going to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what we're looking at. It's sort of a retro analog style future. There's a lot of tactile buttons and things like that. And once you see we get into the game... Uh, there's a lot of that just in the interface and things like that as well. Um, I will say probably the only disadvantage, like I have the ability to continue and things like that down here, but the only disadvantage is because they're updating the game so frequently, if you like to get attached to your characters, you maybe wait on it. Um, like the gameplay loop is solid, but oftentimes, especially when they do major updates or feature updates, it will invalidate old saves. And uh, Blue Bottle has tried to do better about killing old saves, but it still does happen, especially when major, major content updates happen. So just be aware of that. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and start a new character here. Of course, feel free to have a look at all this. This will stay up as long as uh, as long as I leave it, but this is just a quick overview of what's going on. Obviously, you can find them on Steam. Um, either search for Blue Bottle Games or Astronauts. And now the game is going to generate the world and, and all of the other fun stuff. So this game is primarily about flying and salvaging ships. Um, and it is fairly robust. Uh, Bamboozle, not that I'm aware. I, I don't think that there's any planned release date in much the same way that with Neo Scavenger. Um, they kind of just worked on it until they felt like it was done. 
Uh, so eventually there will be a 1.0 release, but if it's anything like Neo Scavenger was, it will probably be a year or two or even more than that before they, they finally call it finished. And there's a lot of planned features that they have on the roadmap that still aren't in the game yet. And there are some new features like combat that they've just now added um, that they still need to refine. So there's there's certainly a lot more work to do. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I feel like they're they're moving at a steady enough clip that I don't feel like I wasted my money. Like I feel like it is absolutely a game that is still being worked on and that has a lot of potential ahead of it. Um, so this is the character creation, and again, all of this is randomized. They give you a whole lot of options. You can see it's it's like pixel art, and honestly, the way your character looks does not have any bearing on anything. Um, it's just personal preference. So for me, I don't particularly care. I, I mean, I'll just like go with whatever. I, I will say the one thing that I have to do is this. If we're going to, well, you know what? Let's let's go with these guys. We're gonna go with the cyber glasses. We'll, we'll go with a mullet. We'll go when you know what? Where we're gonna go with like the full porn stash if we can get it here. Ah, uh, let me see. I guess that's the best we're gonna get. So yeah, all right, that's what we're gonna do. And uh, Godwin Ryan Harris. Normally I'd be okay with that, but I hate people with three names, so we're gonna go with Alvin Russ instead. And, uh, that's it. So we're done. Yeah, um, I, I have absolutely played my fair share. My fair share being several hundred hours of Star Sector, and it is another of my favorite games. Um, I, I'm right there with you. It's, I've been playing it for years and following its development. So, uh, it, it's something that I've considered playing on stream as well. The only problem that I have is I'm not very good at it. For as much time as I have played the game, I'm absolutely terrible at it. Um, and I'm not gonna why, in order to reach anything approaching the end game, I have had to cheat to do it. So I'm very familiar with the ins and outs of the game, but as far as the actual gameplay loop and like flying the ships and stuff like that, I'm still I'm still terrible. I, I need some more time in the cockpit. But uh, so here we are at the well, we've made it past the the appearance and this is the actual character creation screen. So this is where we're going to potentially define our skills and our character traits and things like that. There are personal relationships in the game, although they're not super deep just yet. Eventually, they plan to expand on that. Uh, but they do assign you parents at the very beginning of the game, and you can potentially run into these parents out there in the game world. Uh, although in this case, because we have one person being from Titan and the other being from Luna, they may not be where we are in the solar system. Yeah, that's that's probably my other complaint about Star Sector is that the the updates are infrequent, but every time they come out, it usually breaks all of the mods. And while I enjoy Star Sector, it is absolutely one of it, it's like Skyrim in that the vanilla experience is fine, but the game is massively improved with mods. Um and and I think the Nexrelin mod for Star Sector is kind of a must. So for me, it's like, I'm not going to play Star Sector or a new Star Sector update until next Rowan has been updated for it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm right there with you on that. But at any rate, so this is going to give us a, a brief description. Well, I say brief, it's, it's several paragraphs here. But essentially, uh, you are a spacer. You have all of the problems that long-term living in space uh, brings with it. You can see here for our skills and attributes, we're unfit. Uh, we grew up in micro G. We have a non-circadian rhythm. We're adapted to low sunlight, so we, you know, can't uh, do that. We have radiation exposure. We're feeble, fragile, have a slow metabolism, immunosuppressed. We're an insomniac. So, like we have all of these problems, and they are largely what you would expect to see in a person that has been spending their entire life in a low gravity environment. So we are, I forget where in the solar system we are, but we're out like 
past Saturn or Jupiter. And all of this takes place around a single moon and station. Now, eventually, and this is what I was talking about with the roadmap, eventually, Blue Bottle, the developers, plan to implement faster than light travel and the ability to travel to other planets and stations in the solar system. But they're doing that thing that I think, and, and again, with my own personal experience in game dev, it's better to start with a small scope and expand from there. So they're, they're working on the fundamentals now and then hopefully scale up from there once they actually have everything in the game that they want. So we're, we're going to be in a relatively small scale, but I promise the game itself is still pretty extensive. Um, so we're going to hit OK. This is just giving us a, a basic summary of our character. But this is effectively how you work on your character and build your character. Now, ideally, and this is coming from the developers themselves, what you should be doing is seeking adventure. And seeking adventure just throws random events and things at you. And this will get you skills or injuries or money or all kinds of different things. Um, you can select each of these specific things. So basically, you start at 18, right? And you start with a net worth of about $100. You're going to be saddled with debt from the very beginning. And what we're going to do is try to make money while paying off our debt. Seek Adventure takes one year. It adds one year to your age. Working on your skills, your traits, saving money, things like that will allow you to specifically change things. Uh, so I'll show you what I'm talking about. Uh, like, if I go to work on traits, I now have the entire trait list. It shows me the traits that I have, and it shows me all the traits that are available. So, and unfortunately, I think I have to go through with this now. I can't cancel once I've selected it. Um, but like, for example, if I want to get rid of... Oh, let's see. I want to get rid of unfit, because unfit is just generally not good. It makes you tired all the time you get more tired from being exerted. So I don't like this trait, I don't want it. Well, you see there's these little pips next to the checkbox, and that represents how many years you're gonna add to your age if you select or deselect it. So if I deselect unfit, it's gonna move forward and my age is gonna go up by three years. Now I can continue to select work on traits, but you'll see very quickly that the good traits and the really bad traits do take a lot of time or add a lot of time to your character's age. Age doesn't really matter in the game yet. Um, but if you are older, then that, you know, obviously comes with, oh, you get tired easier, you'll not prone to disease. And since we're already immunosuppressed, we definitely don't want that. So there, there's a lot of depth there. So really they say seek adventure because a lot of the stuff that you're doing here, working on your skills or working on your traits, you can still get those things by seeking adventure. It's just randomized. So we're going to seek some adventure and see what happens. So we're drinking our local watering hole after our shift and we see a unicorn. They're a scion of the Ayo Wai Kid. Nope, not trying to pronounce that. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Ayo Timiwa, which I'm believe is Swahili. I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, they're the owners of the station. So we find an executive sneaking out to rub shoulders and bump uglies with the common folk. You wince as they try to pay for their round in Yuan. It's dollars for the likes of us, friend. If you're careful and lucky, they could be an opportunity. So we have options. What do we want to do with this person? We can start a riot because we don't like them. We can try to pick their pocket and steal some money. We could try to mug them and steal some money, but that's going to make them an enemy and we could potentially end up getting arrested. We could seduce them and see where that leads, or we could get them drunk and just see what happens. So uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to try to get them drunk. Let's see what happens. And there are multiple, there are multiple outcomes for each choice that you make, so it is possible that you can select an option one time and get a good outcome and select that same option the next time it comes up and potentially get a bad outcome. Uh, so let's see, there's one one commodity that's more valuable than all else, even in a monotone, mono town like Kaleg. Kaleg is the station. Information. And you'd bet they're full of it. Sure enough, after ingratiating yourself and making sure their water skin is continually tapped up, the secrets pour out of him. Shocking stuff. Dark. 
You didn't know the CFO's nephew was into that kind of thing. You didn't even know it could be a sex thing. When the shift changes, you're seeing the maintenance access tube together, swearing eternal friendship, but when you sober up, you realize you don't know how to contact them. So I have this person as a contact now. I just don't know how to get in contact with them normally. We also got $850 as a direct result of that. Uh, and now we have skills and tributes. So basically we got skilled in song, liar, and slovenly. And that's essentially how the character creation works. I'm going to seek adventure again. Let's see what happens. Midway through scrapping another hulk, because scrapping ships and, and um, bringing them back up and selling the parts is how you make money. Midway through scrapping another hulk, the cockpit of your allotted salvage pod lights up with red tail pails. Suddenly you're under thrust as one of the engines sends you spiraling away from the hulk's orbit into the black. It's unresponsive and nobody has the fuel to come save you. You're expendable. And that is 100% true of the setting and the characters. If you want to live, it's up to you. So we can either hack the engine, take the stick, and try to control the ship. We can jerry-rig the engine for some engineering. Or we can try to troubleshoot it and figure out what's wrong. I like hacking, so I'm going to hit hack the engine because it's a really good skill. And I hope that we get... Yeah, we got skilled in hacking, which is great. Uh, these old engines are full of software vulnerabilities. You've known this ever since an exploratory dive, but never had you considered trying to exploit them under 3 Gs of thrust. Suddenly, a connection request appears on your portal. Tech support here draws the cowboy hacker under whom you've been studying what seemed to be the problem. Together, you smash the stack on the engine and trigger a reboot. Crisis averted, and you start the burn back to the hope. The unauthorized leave and fuel expenses are docked from your pay, of course. So we got a new contact. This is the hacker that helped us. And we got skilled in hacking, and we also get the treat genius. So... Genius doesn't do a whole lot right now, but hopefully it will in, in the near future. So we could continue to seek adventure, but we've already spent quite some time in the character creation part of the game here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just say seek ship. So there's a couple options here. We can save some money, which basically just takes a year and we get some money. We can also review the re resume to just give us a quick overview of our entire character here. And then we seek ship. Seek Ship. I can words, I promise. So seeking your ship is essentially the part where you say, okay, I'm ready to start the game. And seeking a ship is, I want to try to find a ship that I can then use to go out into the boneyards and try to start my salvage career. Um, ultimately, we will probably be leaving whatever ship we start with behind, but there are definitely some ships that are better than others, and there are some that are more useful than others. This one in particular has a lot of the stuff that we're going to need in the early game. So, because it's a better ship, though, the mortgage is also higher. So, effectively, we're going to be in debt a little over $800,000, and we're going to have to pay at least $2,100 every shift. Now, there are four shifts. Four shifts or five shifts? The shifts are up here. So you have one, two, three, four shifts in a day. And time passes in relatively real time unless you fast forward. So basically, we just work forever and occasionally sleep a few hours when and where we can. It's, it's the life in a space dystopia. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take the ship again just so we can get into the game and start doing stuff. So I'm now the proud owner of a TU-76, and I can now reach some of the outer derelicts beyond the watchful eye of the Yardmasters, because we can absolutely steal a ship. The only problem is, if it doesn't have a transponder, we won't be able to dock, so... It sort of disincentivizes, and that's a relatively recent addition to the game, by the way. Uh, you used to be able to just take whatever ship you want, and that was it, and nobody asked you anything about it. But now ships have transponders, and if your transponder doesn't work and it's not registered to you, then stations won't let you dock. And so it disincentivizes you just going out, finding a better ship, and then immediately upgrading. It adds a little more incentive to stick with the ship you get. Uh, now that I'm on my own terms, my next move is up to me. Maybe score a value of part or two for resale or reuse, put down a platinum tier payout on a gig, or maybe even discover a ship discarded before it's time. Whatever the case, it beats sweating in a suit all day for someone else's profit. Time to get out there and find your future. So yeah, they're going to give us the overview just in case we want to review anything. Although at this point, it is too late to go back. It says resume ready, which means we can now hit submit and we start the game in earnest. 
And so here we are. This is this is the game and I can move the camera around, but this is mostly a left click, right click interface. Um, there's very little in the game that you're going to interact with without the mouse, which may be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you interpret it. So uh, we don't have any objectives here because I think I have the tutorials turned off, but we're going to go ahead and start picking things up. Uh, first thing I want to do is put on shoes and a jumpsuit just so that we're not uh, so that we're not cold and we're not freezing and all that. So just picking this up, we now have shoes on. We now have a jumpsuit on. And if this looks familiar, again, Neo Scavenger, we also happen to have some food in the pocket. So we've got a toilet here. We've got a sink here. And a lot of this is going to seem obtuse, at least at the beginning. It is kind of an abstracted view. Um, kind of like Dwarf Fortress or things like that. We're going to go over here. We're going to turn on the power in this little apartment unit that we're living in. We got some beds. They've got some bins here, which I think I will try to check just to see if there's anything in them. Um, probably not. But I haven't played this in a while, so I don't know if they're actually going to give me stuff. So we got some cigarettes. Uh, does the pack of cigarettes have anything in it? It does not. Okay, so that's effectively worthless to us. Ah, here we go. All right, so we've got a bag, which again, if you've played Neo Scavenger, then you're familiar with the need for storage space. Uh, and then this is just a pressure suit, which is not like... So there's two main types of suits in this game. There's the pressure suit, which effectively seals you from vacuum, but doesn't have its own power or air supply. So this is just an emergency thing, but it's all we're going to have for a little while. And then there's actual EVA suits, which have power and oxygen and CO2 scrubbers and all that stuff. But for right now, we're just going to have the pressure suit. Now, the pressure suit is not terribly comfortable, but it will protect us from vacuum. So when we go out into space, we're going to need that in order to survive. Uh, we have a drink pouch, which is empty currently, but that's okay because uh, as long as we're on the station, we can get as much water as we need. Uh, we've also got a toolbox here with some tools in it. I'm gonna go ahead and just take the whole toolbox. And we're gonna come over here to the sink and I am going to not only drink, but we should, if I'm not mistaken, be able to fill up our drink pouch. Uh, maybe not. For whatever reason, it's not letting me fill it up. I don't know why. Well, poop. Not a big deal. We can get water elsewhere. So now that we've powered this up, we can actually get outside. And we're going to get our little thing here. This is just your introduction to the game. Um, effectively letting you know about K-Leg, how this is the station. This is where you grow up. It's, it is, again, in much the same way as Neo Scavenger, it is setting the tongue. It is letting you know exactly what you're dealing with here and what kind of world you're living in. It, it is, as I said, a space dystopia. Uh, life is cheap and there are no morals here, so it's, it's every person for themselves. I don't know why you're throwing this at me again. And so one of the very first things that we're going to be able to do is, you'll see here, this is again kind of a tutorial. So we're going to pick this up and I'm going to install... Uh, let's see, and I'm, I'm interacting, I'll show you guys here in a second. So I'm now using the tools that I have to install this piece of wire right here. Uh, again, this is part of the tutorial, but what this is going to do is open up this door and then we'll actually be able to get into this room. It is effectively showing you that you can build things. And this is a major part of the game, is building and breaking down ships. So this is going to take a long time, but I can speed up time here. There's a lot of start and stop. And because we're using crappy tools, it does take a little while uh, for us to actually get that done. If we had better tools, then we would be able to do this much faster. Uh, there is a... So this is kind of a secret, but there is a rack here that has some more tools in it. If you don't know that, then you would think this is just a waste of time. But right, right here-ish, there's a wall and there's a rack against that wall. Now eventually we could come back in here with a flashlight and potentially uh, 
potentially see if there's more in there, but I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it. And so yeah, we can zoom out, we got ourselves a little food stall here where we can get some food, and actually that may not be a bad idea because our character is hungry. Um, let me see. We will trade. And as you can see, prices, very, very high. I don't know that I want to spend half of the money that we currently have on food. Thankfully, they do start us with one of these, which is effectively a uh, space ration. So I'm going to go ahead and eat this instead, and that will get rid of our hungry status. And now we're stuffed, which also not good, makes us a little slower, but uh, it's better than being hungry. So you can see there's other characters around here. We could interact with them if we want, but again, the character interaction at this point in the game is not fully fleshed out. So there's effectively two different vendors here, and I know it doesn't look like it, but again, it's kind of an abstracted game. So we have this, which is the licensed supply kiosk. Now, as a salvage technician, we are supposed to have a license if we're doing any salvaging in the, in the boneyards. Well, we're not going to do that initially because the license is several thousand dollars and we don't have that much money. The other thing is the scrap, the, the supply kiosk. So this is effectively someone that will buy and sell anything, but we're not going to get very good prices for it. However, we don't need a license to do any trading with them. So these guys are going to be our best friend, at least in the early game, until we make enough money to buy a license. Now there should be an actual supply merchant. Yeah, so there's a supply merchant here. This is a relatively recent addition, but they have a lot of the basic necessities. So if we hadn't picked up any of the tools from our room, this would be a great place to pick them up from. Um, we'll obviously have to buy those tools, but it still gives us the option to get access to the tools if we didn't find them. Now, I think we will probably find a lot of what we need out in, um, out in the wreckage, but you can see stuff like EVA suits. These are very, very expensive, uh, but they are very useful as well. Um, I don't think we really need anything from here. Uh, one of the things that I do want to buy at some point is going to be this laser torch, which is going to replace a lot of our tools. Um, but for right now, the main thing that I'm going to want is battery chargers for the tools that we do have. So I'm going to buy one each of those. And I don't think they sell the batteries separately, which is unfortunate. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like they do. But that's okay. It's not the end of the world. We're going to go ahead and pay for that. And those things should go to our ship. Or they may end up in our inventory. Yeah, these are small enough to fit in our inventory. Uh, but yeah, just for fun, let's go have a look at the scrap dealer and see if they have anything interesting. Um, they usually don't, but it never hurts to check just to be safe. Yeah, so they've got some conduit. They've got just random parts, aluminum, steel, carbon fiber. Um, I tell you what. I think I'm gonna buy some carbon fiber because... It's not very expensive, but in my experience, you end up needing carbon fiber to repair a lot of stuff, and it's very, very hard to find. So thankfully, with it being so cheap, I'm just going to go ahead and buy all the carbon fiber they have, so that if we need some carbon fiber to repair things, we'll have it. Um, but yeah, I think that's about all we're going to do here on the station, at least for now. And I think this is going to be our ship. It'll either be on this end or it'll be on the other end. And we are going to roll into our ship. And this is the ship. And uh, you'll notice everything looks kind of crappy. And that's because it is. Because this ship is a piece of junk. Um, and we will deal with that in time. Uh, these red parts that you see here are actually patches. So this is a destroyed piece of floor. And it's just held together with duct tape effectively. Plus, we've got a lot of scrap and other stuff, and just in general, the ship is in very, very poor quality. However, the longer we stay here, the more money we're going to get charged. Now, there's a part of me that wants to see if they fix that. I don't know if it will let us leave. And so here's just some basic control instructions of how the ship works. Uh, so we get saddled with the scintillating leaf. 
is is the ship that we are currently flying. Um, part of me, hello again, game master. Part of me wants to see if we can um, cheese this a little bit. So this is this is a little bit of meta knowledge, uh, and and I know some people don't like it when you do this, but. Uh, I don't think... So every time you come to the station, the longer you're at the station, the more money they charge you. It's effectively like a dock fee. But I don't think that they charge you anything before you leave the station the first time, just as part of the tutorial. So I think... And, and I may soft black us and we may have to start over. I don't know. I'm doing well, Game Master. How are you doing today? I don't know if we'll have to start over, but I'm going to try this anyway. What I want to do is I want to try to repair as much of the ship as we can. And I want to try and get as much trash off of the ship as we can um, before we leave. Because that's going to put us in a more favorable position. Uh, again, that may end up soft lacking us, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I'm going to put us on auto. And by default, yeah, our character is going to try to repair everything in the vicinity. So I'm just going to up the speed here and let him do his thing. Or we're, we're going to let Alvin repair some stuff. And he's just basically running around trying to repair things. Um, gathering, for example, like, hey, I want to repair this wall, so I got to get scrap and aluminum to do it. And I, I want to at least attempt to put us in a better position before we go out there, because if the ship falls apart... We don't have another ship that we can actually use to survive in. And that's okay. I mean, that's that's the nature of the game. Oh, here we go with this. So we're getting proximity alarms because other ships are coming and going. And uh, it will give us that beep. It also slows the game down whenever we get that, that alert. And, uh, never fear, I'm not gonna sit here and do this forever. As a matter of fact, I think I'm gonna be a little more choosy about what we're doing here. Um, I will cancel action, first of all. And I want to restore... This is the control station for our ship. So that's, that's the first thing I want. I want to restore the control station so that it doesn't crap out on us. Um, I also want to double check that our, uh, air pump is in good shape. Because obviously, if we don't have air, we're, we're going to be in a bad spot. So I'm going to go ahead and repair the air. Um, and then our batteries as well. Yeah, see, like, this battery is damaged, so it's completely non-functional. And we don't want that. So definitely going to restore this battery as well. And I'm going to see if we can fully fix the other battery. We may not be able to. Uh, let's just try repairing and see what we need. I need a motherboard, small parts, and electronic parts. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think you can rename characters, but we can potentially recruit other characters at some point. Again, the, the, the NPC interaction isn't fully fleshed out yet, but it is possible to hire crew. Uh, let's see. I think that's about the best we're going to get. So we've actually got two batteries on this ship that are both damaged. And that is not great, but whatever. Again, I'm not going to make you guys sit here and watch me fix every single part of the ship. We'll get to that eventually, but we're not going to do that right now. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to switch to docking controls. And this is your docking interface. If you play this game, you're going to get very, very, very familiar with this interface. Uh, because you're going to be seeing it a lot. This is how you dock and undock with everything. Ships, stations, whatever. So the first thing we got to do is, and, and I'm going to give you guys the brief tutorial of how this works. So from the docking screen, you're going to need to select your docking target. And this is going to be universal instructions for how docking works. You need to select your docking target. Now, when you're already docked with something, it should only show you one target, and that's going to be the target that you're docked with. In this case, uh, I mean, it is still summertime, technically, so I'm not terribly cold. I can't put the jacket on, though, if it makes you worry. But uh, right now, we're docked with K-Leg, 
And so this is the only target. So we're going to select Kale, and then it's only going to give us one option to undock, which is pushback and taxi. So by selecting this, we're either going to accept or reject. And a lot of this other stuff, it may matter later down the, down the line, but right now this, this information is largely useless. So you're either going to reject, which is going to back you out of this, or we're going to accept, which is going to undock us. So I'm going to hit accept. And we are now cleared to undock. You'll see that the ring around us has now turned green, and we are now cleared to disengage. Uh, I heard of objects in space, but I don't really know anything about it. it. It didn't really pop up on my radar. But this is part of what makes me like the game. I, I like the crunchy kind of tactile, um, you know, you push the button in the interface. So I'm hitting the clamp engage, and it does take a second. And you'll hear the proximity warning. The proximity warning is letting us know we're very close to the station. I'm going to go ahead and clear that warning. And uh, yeah, so we are now free of the station. So I'm going to back up a little bit. And just like in other space games, you'll see we're burning remass. Remass is a limited resource and it's what allows us to move around in space. So we're going to back up from the station and the next thing we're going to do is find a wreck. So each and every one of these little asterisks or stars or whatever you want to call them each of these is a wreck and so i'm just going to select one and what's going to do when i select a target is it's going to show me my relative velocity and my relative cross to that target now what we want to try to do is get these as close to zero as we can right now we're about 60 kilometers away our bearing is 120 degrees off target and if we didn't, if I did absolutely nothing from right now, it would take us a little over 600 seconds to make contact with that target. So what we're going to do is we're going to spin the ship around and you'll notice I'm spinning the ship so our bearing is decreasing and I'm going to get us aligned on a bearing with this target. And I, I tend to do this very slowly. And you can kind of hear the ship groaning as we do that. That's another another recent addition that I'm very fond of. Whoops! So there we go. Our bearing is, is not bad. So our relative velocity, we're moving towards the target at about 100 meters per second. But we're also crossing the velocity. In other words, we're moving laterally, perpendicular to the ship, at about 80 meters per second. So we need to bleed that down. And that's going to... Oh, we're autosaving. So, I autosave every 30 minutes, which tells you how long we've been playing. Right, so I'm going to bring our cross as close to zero as possible. Now our bearing is still in good shape, and our velocity is about 60 meters per second. So now, I'm going to up that to about 200 meters per second. And we will adjust our cross and our bearing a little bit. So we want to, again, we want to be as close to zero on these as we can. It's about 250 seconds until we reach the target. So we've got a couple of options. Either I can now back out of this interface and in real time start fixing our ship as we fly, or alternately, while I'm in the cockpit here, I can just fast forward and we'll get a proximity warning as we get closer to the ship um, about five kilometers or so. So you see the range here as it, as it backs down and when we hit five kilometers, it's going to let us know that we're getting close. So now I'm going to bleed our speed down to about 100 meters per second. Because any faster than that, and we risk damaging the ship when we dock. And so now we're going to go back to the docking interface. So we'll go select docking target again. It's showing a question mark because we've never docked with this ship before. So we don't know what its transponder is. We're going to go ahead and select that. And here we'll hit docking. Normally you would have the pushback and taxi on the left. But now, because we're not docked yet, it's giving us the option to dock. So we'll click that button. Again, most of this doesn't matter. We either reject or accept. I'm going to accept. And that brings up our docking interface. And as you can see, we're now moving in space. And I kind of spent a little more time explaining that than I probably should. But uh, we ended up bumping the ship there because I took a little too long to explain it. That's okay, though. We're moving at low speed, so the damage should be minimal. But yeah, we are now docked. Essentially what you want to do is align the ring like I did, and you'll see when it turns green, you can hit this clamp engage button, and then it docks you. 
So now we go back. We are now officially docked. It tells us our current tra trajectory. I'm sorry, this is our, uh, the actual ship that we're on. Um, and yet, yeah, so we're good. Uh, if we want, you can mute your alarms. I'm not going to do that though, because I like to know when people are coming after me. Um, we've also got a couple of other things in here that I guess I should probably show you. So you got print status. This will show me all of the status of the current ship that we're on. So like if you have an issue and you're not sure what the issue is, or if you're not sure if all of your engines are working or anything like that, this is a good way to find out. So like, for example, there are two O2 pumps on our ship. I already repaired one, but apparently there's another one and it's not working. Um, we don't have a reactor, so it's not finding anything there. Uh, our transponder antenna, again, apparently we have two antennas on this ship, but only one of them is working. All four of our thrusters are working. This is how much remass we have, how much power we have. So that that's just a basic rundown of your ship status. We can go to ship's logs. This will tell you a bunch of different things, but most importantly, if you have access to the ship logs, it will tell you the codes to any doors that are currently on that ship. So like if I get onto a ship and the doors are locked, and I want to take that ship, if I can get to the control station or the control panel, I can use the ship logs to tell me what the codes are to those doors, which is one way to open doors if, for example, you don't have the hacking skill, which is why I took the hacking skill because it helps us bypass that. So yeah, we are now on a derelict and we now have the ability to potentially make some money. Uh, one thing that I do need to do, though, right away is we need to drop these battery chargers on the ground. And I'm also going to drop all these spare parts on the ground as well. Um, so at this point, we're going to put on our pressure suit. It's not going to let us put on our pressure suit. So here's the other thing about pressure suits. They don't have their own oxygen supply, which means you need to be in an oxygenated environment before you put on the suit, otherwise you will suffocate. So I'll put the suit on. The suit doesn't necessarily need any oxygen, but the helmet does. The helmet is what will make you suffocate. So now that I'm putting on the helmet, we are now oxygen sealed, and it says we're airtight. So we can now go into vacuum with no problem. The only issue is we're rebreathing our own air, so it's only a matter of time before we start to suffocate. Now you'll notice it's extremely dark. Thankfully, this suit by default comes with a light on it or a light in the pocket. This is a flashlight effectively, but we have to have it in our hand in order for us to have the light. So I want to title the power and let there be light. So this is our first derelict, and uh, yeah, it doesn't look like a very big one. In fact, this is the whole ship. <laughs> what you see here, it's basically just a 3 by 5 square, it looks like. Um, which isn't great, but it does have a control panel, and it's not damaged. Well, it's not completely destroyed, so we're going to uninstall this. I, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? The AI is a little dumb sometimes. Uh, my concentration does not increase when I wear glasses, but uh, my intelligence actually goes up by 500 points. Um, and to answer your question, Bamboozle, about this long. You can see we're getting the message. We feel vaguely unwell and flushed. That means that we are already beginning to experience the side effects of hypercapnia, which is what happens when you are exposed to too much carbon dioxide. So this is not the point where we need to worry. Um, you will see we'll start to have some mild pain here in a little bit, and that's also a thing. But there's a little notice over here, either O2 low if we're running out of oxygen or CO2 high. So I generally try to push it until we get the CO2 high warning, but the longer you go with hypercapnia, the longer it's going to take you to reoxygenate. So I'm going to see if we can get this uninstalled and it doesn't look like it. Yeah, we're already 
I'm terrified. We're feeling nauseous. We have a headache. We're experiencing mild hypercapnia. So yeah, that's, we did not get nearly as far as I thought we would. So I'm going to get into the airlock, let that close behind us, pop in here. And there is aerodynamic, or I'm sorry, um, what is, what is the name? It's not fluid dynamics. It's uh, the dynamics of air. So, but anyway, so I'm gonna take the helmet off. Immediately our pain goes away. I'm gonna give us just a minute so that we can breathe in some air. And then we'll put the helmet back on and go in there. So if you are uninstalling something or you're repairing something, uh, you it, it does save your progress on that. So we, we don't have to start over on that control panel. We can just go and pick up where we left off. So I'm going to continue to uninstall this. And as usual, we'll fast forward until we start to see hypercapnia pop up. We're already feeling vaguely unwell. We're experiencing mild hypercapnia, but we're close to finishing. So I'm just going to power through. And we got it. So now I am going to pick this up and we're going to drag it back over here to our ship. And this is going to be one of the first things that we that we sell. Yeah, you do have to take the helmet off in order to stop suffocating. Speaking of, let's go ahead and do that, which thankfully you don't have to drop whatever you're carrying in order to uh, in order to stop suffocating. So we will drop this here and now we have one big part. And I did see there was a Ben on the other ship, so I'm going to go back over there real quick, and we will just see what was in that bin, if anything. Hopefully there's something good in it. Uh, we got a t-shirt, which is only 50%, so not a huge thing. I'm going to grab these motors, though, because motors can be used for repairs. I don't think there's really anything else that we're going to need here. Um, there is a little carbon fiber, so I'll grab that. And that's about it. Everything else looks damaged. What is this? This is an O2 alarm. Yeah, okay. So that that's about all we're going to get from this ship. And that happens. I, I mean, sometimes you get into a ship and it's just... There's not a lot there. It doesn't really do any good. So we'll go ahead and drop these parts on the ground, including the motors. And, uh, yeah, we'll take the helmet off. I usually put the, the helmet on the clip point. And we'll toggle the power ref in our light so we're not wasting the battery. I do want to keep the PDA on our person, but I'm not going to keep it in our hand. Uh, so, yeah, there we go. That That is our first derelict. We didn't get a whole lot for it, but it's not the end of the world. As you could see on the map, uh, there's... There's a lot of ships out there. No, no, you're you're right there, Bam. Uh, that that is, I I know exactly what you're talking about. He you, you you start to get that panic. You're like, oh my god, uh, and then yeah, now nah, it's that's one of the first things that they teach you, um, if you're in certain places where gas masks are necessary. Uh, and no Game Master, I do not have any mods on this game. In fact, I don't actually know if there are mods for this game, if I'm being perfectly honest. At least, if there are, I've never heard of them. It doesn't mean they don't exist, I'm just not familiar with them. Uh, do we now... Yeah, we still won't have the parts that we need to repair that battery. What about this battery? Uh, actually, that battery's in good condition. Let me make sure our RCSs are in good condition. That one is good. I'm basically just giving the ship a once-over. Uh, I don't want anything falling apart on us while we're out in the void of space. And let's see. That one is okay, but I'm going to go ahead and restore it anyway. Restore it. Okay, so yeah, uh, with this one behind us, we are actually, you know what, hold on. One more thing we need to do. I keep saying we're going to leave and then we don't leave. Uh, I'm going to, oh. 
install these battery chargers. I just need to figure out where we have space. Uh, let's see. I guess we could put them in here, in the airlock. So the reason I'm installing the battery chargers is because all of our tools are battery powered. And if we don't have chargers, then we would have to spend money on batteries. And I don't want to spend a bunch of money on batteries. And there we go. We'll install this charger here. And then I'm effectively going to take the, um, I'm going to take the batteries out of our tools and put them in the charger so they can charge while we move. Although we're probably not going to get a whole lot of charge just because we're now in the boneyard. And that means that we're, we're going to be in close proximity of other wrecks. So it should not take us nearly as long to get to the next derelict as it did to get to this one. Uh, I do not have a reactor on this ship, but reactors are a thing. Um, that will definitely be something that we want to get our hands on as soon as possible. But uh, it may not be necessarily useful, at least initially, if we don't have a ship large enough for it. And uh, let me see, inventory, and we're going to take the battery out of the welder. And I'm going to put the battery in the charger, which, yeah, so charge is only 70%, but you can see it going up. Now, the problem with battery chargers and things like that is, again, we have batteries, but we're drawing from the charge on our batteries in order to charge the batteries for our tools. So... Think of the ship as an enclosed environment. We only have a certain amount of oxygen and a certain amount of electricity on board at any given moment. Now the batteries are high capacity and they'll last for a while and thankfully they're lossless batteries. Yeah, the ships are battery powered by default unless you get a reactor and even then you basically use the reactors to charge the batteries but not to power the ship. Because the reactor is a fusion reactor and it produces way more electricity than you're ever going to need to power the ship. So rather than run your reactor constantly, which is super expensive, it's usually better to just run the reactor long enough to get the batteries fully charged and then turn it off again. But uh, we don't really have enough space on this ship for a reactor, so that's not a concern. Maybe we'll find a larger ship that has one, but mostly, at least in the early game, any reactors we find, we're probably going to end up selling. So we're going to get our auto save here, but let's go ahead and undock from this guy. We're going to push back, accept, and we are going to disengage.